Hi everyone, we're live. Welcome on this third webinar of the Blockchain Student Association of EPFL. I'm Gaspar Pelizzi, the president of the association, and we are lucky to have with us today two, two very knowledgeable guests. Um, so the Dr. Adrien Trecani, the CEO of Metaco. Hi Adrien, welcome back. And um, Dominique Goy, managing partner and uh, uh, board member at Wiccan. Hi Dominique. Hi, good afternoon. So today we're going to talk about uh, tokenization. Uh, we had two present webinars on uh, digital asset custody and uh, decentralized finance. And uh, this new type of asset that we see uh, with uh, blockchain technology is uh, even today a very prominent subject. Um, around 2015, uh, the ERC20 standard saw the light. So it was a new standard to create a token and the Ethereum blockchain. And in the following years, in the following months, uh, we saw a tremendous increase in the, in the number of those assets. And uh, uh, well, in 2017, as you may know, we saw a lot of ICOs, initial coin offering, uh, a lot of projects were uh, selling this token. Uh, so this token can be of different types. It can be uh, commodity, security, et cetera. Uh, so that's something that we'll go deeper into uh, later. And well, there are a new type of investments and uh, they represent a revolution for uh, uh, trading different type of assets and uh, those commodity. So today we're going to go deeper into this subject and maybe um, uh, take some questions as like, what are the different processes of uh, creating a token? What are maybe the legal challenges or the technical challenges for, this, uh, uh, for the company that choose this, um, this type of asset? Uh, is the ecosystem mature enough for, uh, for us to use them uh, as a security issues? I mean, all this question, and uh, I invite the chat, um, the people watching the stream to ask directly their question to the speakers in the ask question button uh, below. And well, yeah, without waiting more, um, maybe if you want to start, Adrien, uh, introducing us to this, this team, uh, defining what are the different type of assets and uh, what, what is it? Absolutely. So um, be before speaking about uh, how we see tokenization from a corporate point of view at, at Medaco, um, I think tokenization is the recognition that um, blockchain technology and, and distributed ledger technology has some advantages. Um, in fact, Bitcoin, uh, when it was released in 2009 or 2008, um, it promised a new system where uh, a form of asset, you know, this Bitcoin, which is some form of currency or commodity, uh, would be easily exchangeable, uh, transferable between multiple parties, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, no intermediary, in theory, low fees, uh, and, and lower risks in, during the settlement process, the clearing process. Uh, I think the recognition of these advantages um, is, uh, is what motivates uh, the introduction of, of the notion of token or tokenization. Uh, however, we've gone through multiple phases. Uh, as you reminded, um, we started with this ERC20 token on the Ethereum uh, distributed ledger, uh, which uh, was mainly leveraged to uh, create so-called ICOs, uh, or tokens used to raise funds, raise funds at an early stage, generally based on some uh, preliminary business plan, like a white paper, uh, to finance the construction of a company or a business. Uh, what we've seen is that you know the regulators have moved in and um, ICOs have become much harder to put in place, in particular in the form they were a few years ago. However, the same principle can be put in place for more traditional securities. Uh, we speak here about asset tokenization or security tokens, where you take a normal security, a normal asset like a building uh, or a painting or an equity or a fixed income security, and you say, let's try to make it more efficient in different ways, more efficient to transfer, to store, uh, to settle when it is traded, and use the same principle as the one backing Bitcoin or backing Ethereum uh, to uh, actually secure the whole life cycle of this, uh, of this asset. Uh, one advantage is that it becomes uh, completely divisible. You can store very tiny units of this asset, and I think Dominic is, is really the expert because they you know, at weekend they, they do tokenization with uh, things that are hardly divisible, like buildings, for instance. Um, and uh, we we, are, we start seeing on the market this uh, stronger demand for particularly illiquid or unbankable assets. 
Uh, and obviously in this context, and then we close on that, uh, Medaco, uh, which is uh, specialized uh, on um, digital asset infrastructure, essentially everything that's, that is required to secure such uh, tokens, uh, well, we, we see an, an incredible opportunity for us to support banks in this uh, migration on the market where banks uh, start adopting these new form of assets expressed as tokens. Yeah. And probably to do the link with Adrien, uh, it's sure that the introduction of all the new regulation lately uh, to the industry uh, is making the industry uh, becoming much more uh, attractive to the institutional investors. Those institutional investors need custody solution uh, like the one Metaco is providing. And the other big thing that is currently changing, it's uh, the central bank uh, digital currency that should come live uh, hopefully in the next quarters and also projects like Libra with the e-euro, e-dollar and, and type of digital currencies that could come live in the coming probably weeks for Libra. Uh, so tokenization is still at, at a very early stage currently because we are uh, lacking uh, uh, the big institution to be really live with custody solutions. Uh, but we are at the really beginning, but now all those traditional financial businesses are starting to enter the market. Uh, they are starting to moving away from only doing proof of concept to really uh, thinking of going live. And I'm really sure that 2021, you will see lots of uh, uh, tokenization in all the financial industry. So, and just to get back to what is a token? It's a store of value and it's a link between a traditional asset usually and this digital token that is uh, freely and uh, quite easily uh, transferable between people. So we have already, thank you very much, uh, Dominique and Adrien, for this introduction. We have already a question from Sophia that asks So, what are the main challenges to handle the security of uh, tokenization? tokenized assets and how do you uh, deal with them? Well, I think for a token, there are multiple forms of challenges. Uh, one is not at all on the technology side. It's more how do you relate some, an asset in the real world with an asset on the blockchain? And there are some legal considerations. There are some regulatory considerations. There are some constraints that you have as a technology platform to make sure that you satisfy the law and the regulation. So this is one thing. I'm not the expert with that, so I will not emphasize too much this aspect. But on the other side, you also need to be able to deal or to secure, to store the, the token itself uh, in a way that is, uh, that is in institutional grade, I would say. And um, if you think about traditional cryptocurrencies, generally managing them is only about uh, storing a key and being able to sign a transaction to move the assets uh, here and there, you know, moving a Bitcoin from address A to address B. When you deal with a token or a security token, you start having a complete life cycle uh, to manage securely, you know, from minting the assets to burning the assets, potentially paying dividends uh, or any form of other corporate action if we speak about an equity token. These things are in a way as critical as the management of tr simple transactions themselves. Uh, put yourself in the shoes of a, of a custodian that is managing equity tokens. Well, at some point they may have to, uh, they may have to mint new coins or, or they may have to, for the clients to mint new shares or to pay dividends or to apply one of these actions. So uh, one of the challenges is to, first of all, define uh, the token in the right way. And this is generally something which is independent of then the infrastructure you use to secure it. It's generally more at the smart contract level. Uh, how do you define the properties of this token? How do you define its features? And do you align them with uh, the regulations in place and the characteristics of the, of the asset class? And then once you define these specificities in the smart contract or the, the primitives that you have on the ledger, then how do you interact with these features in a secure way? And where we position ourselves with Medaco is we support the banks and, and the financial infrastructure providers uh, in the interaction with these uh, critical features of the assets directly on the chain. Yeah, and probably if I take back like all the benefits and the risk of tokenization, so within benefits, as uh, Adrien mentioned before, you've got all the 
transparency, the potential uh, speed and cost efficiencies that we could uh, reach at a later stage, but without a secondary market uh, currently and without a CBDC, it's not really easy to get all those benefits yet uh, activable. There is a fractional ownership. Uh, there is uh, also uh, the real-time clearing and settlement, but around all this, there is all the legal issues. So, for example, that we can tokenize, what we had to do is to create uh, a securitization vehicle in Luxembourg to be able uh, to tokenize whatever type of equity or debt, uh, and it's to follow all the current regulation and rules. Uh, we had to do this first before tokenizing uh, those notes uh, through, uh, so it has been done through Ethereum, through what is called a triple seven, so ERC uh, token. And I see that Cyril Lapinte is on the call, so in case he can help me because I'm not the tech guy here. But the advantage of this uh, triple C, uh, triple seven um, token is that there is an operator as well that is linked to that smart contract that can act on behalf of other people. And as, as most of our clients are institution people, if you're working with a family office, a small private bank, with an asset manager, he wants to be able to do some transaction on behalf of, of his clients. And uh, this is why we have uh, uh, gone to, to that uh, type of token. And um, what else? Um, I think this is the main characteristic of like the setup of the platform. I think it's interesting to see that we, have, we are lucky enough to have Cyril Lapin in the call, who is not part of the panel, but he's answering, he's taking some of the pain out uh, away from us and answering the most uh, technical questions. So <laughs> thank you, Cyril. Next time we, we invite you uh, in, the, in, the, in the panel, actually. Indeed, hi, Cyril. Um, I'm seeing that the, the question have been uh, so answered part of in, in the chat already. Uh, just Hello. mentioning... Hello. Like, Sorry, and, and also probably one of the most important thing also that is done through this ERC triple seven and the, the way we have uh, coordinate all, all this is uh, all people before investing they must be whitelisted so all the KYC and AML process is done uh, before in order to be able to buy those tokens you need to be whitelisted in order to transfer them to someone else so if you want to sell it you can sell it only to someone that has been whitelisted before. And everything is uh, 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 available uh, within the smart contract as well, so you cannot transfer it to someone that is not quite listed. So this is one of the characteristics of that token as well. One question, I, is what one question I had for you, Dominic, um, is given that you have this very practical implementation of, uh, of different you know, tokenization of real asset classes, is how do you actually implement the, the governance in your smart contract? Is it very limited in the way that uh, you only have a few entry points in the smart contract and most of the governance is done off chain? Or do you actually have the whole, let's say, regulatory framework, I would say, uh, implemented straight on the chain, therefore being potentially slow and costly? What is your approach to it and how have you implemented that with your existing use cases? Yeah, uh, it's true that, like, all transfer are blocked and you need a default operator to validate the transfer and the default operator uh, will be linked to the issuer of the token and it will control at any time what's going on uh, with all the tokens that has been issued and this is also quite an interesting point for people who for example can lose uh, their access to their private address we will be able to redo uh, all the kyc and the, the aml and to uh, potentially burnt or recreate token uh, corresponding to to their initial investment somewhere else. So there is those type of default operator available uh, at all time uh, that can manage all the tokens. And to, uh, who has also the uh, legal responsibility in front of the Luxembourg regulation, uh, he must know uh, all the time who is uh, his shareholders. Thank you very much, Dominique. Um, so we have another question uh, on uh, owners' rights. So indeed, um, so let me read the question. Once a token is released, what amount of owner rights the creator should still have on the smart contract? I mean, indeed, it's an interesting question because I mean, one of the main um, uh, ad word of blockchain is decentralization, uh, uh, trustless, etc. 
And so I don't know how the your client respond to that. Uh, it, it, or is it compatible to more corporate industry, the most corporate industry? And yeah, so what kind of controls they still have on, on those tokens? Are they really uh, uh, working on their own, etc.? Uh, what, I, what I can say here is that uh, working with regulated um, institutions like banks, uh, any single point of trust where you have one particular entry point uh, is rejected as much as possible. Now, uh, it doesn't mean that the contract itself should have some form of media approval or some, some advanced governance directly on chain. Some banks decide that they potentially prefer having the governance being implemented outside of the chain, potentially in an HSM or with some fancy cryptographic scheme using MPC, for instance, multi-party computation. Um, so um, I think it, it's not clear to me whether there is one best practice today, uh, whether the owner still keeps some rights after the creation of the contract, um, or if there should be some delegation of authority to then <coughs> other parties. That would certainly be the best practice to leverage the, the security of the chain, having some, some amount of governance on chain. But we also know, being working with banks today, that uh, they have so they have they have workflows and 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 processes that are so complicated uh, and so that evolve and for which they would not want to expose any information on chain. That it's obvious they would also have their own processes off chain and to secure that with some uh, technology like what we do at Medaco. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Do you want to add something? Uh, like the way uh, we have set up the, uh, we can tokenize and uh, using this securitization vehicle makes like all the decision has been centralized to at the level of the compartment of the securitization vehicle. So there is no uh, like there is no much freeway at the token level. There is only the economic rights that are linked to the token, and that's it. There is no voting rights currently. Nothing else. For the for the street transaction we've done until now. Okay, and then, well, jumping on another question. Therefore, do you see a future where the stock market is token tokenized and decentralized? Seems that there are some projects already that are working on that. Um, I'm wondering what your opinion is. Well, I mean, it depends what we call stock markets. Uh, the the current. Uh, uh, stock exchange, stock exchanges in the market are already very efficient. They are very centralized, but they're very efficient, very fast. Um, one could argue they settle the, 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 trans the trades quite fast also, or at least at a, at a speed that is sufficient for most activities. Um, so the question is, do you really want to replace this with um, sort of distributed technology? Uh, I have multiple answers to this. Uh, first one is, you may not want to replace what already works pretty well, um, uh, but you may want to actually use this DL, distributed ledger technology for, or Ethereum, for instance, for tokens or assets which are un, you know, unbankable or not interesting from the exchange point of view because they are not enough, they don't have enough traction to generate a lot of you know, high value tra you know, trading volume, and therefore uh, exchanges don't want to onboard them, and therefore uh, it's impossible to have a secondary market for them. So for these assets. Having a distributed way to, of trading them is obviously very valuable. And this is what we see with all of these uh, illiquid asset classes, whether it's uh, SME stock, whether it's early stage companies, uh, whether it's uh, art or, or real estate. So that's one part. The other part is if you have, a, you know, if you consider, and I'm a little bit of that point of view, that centralization is not good uh, and that uh, distributing um, uh, a service provides more. You know, you, you, you opens the market to more parties, uh, potentially decreases the cost through competition uh, and removes a lot of the frictions. Uh, if you believe that, then co providing a competition to the centralized exchanges with a distributed platform is, is certainly a very valuable service. Now the question is, can you reach then the level of performance of uh, what these platforms are able to provide? Today, no, uh, but maybe it will be the case uh, tomorrow that with uh, you know peer-to-peer -peer trading or off-chain trading, we might reach something that is actually competing with uh, centralized platforms. So I, I see this really as an incredible opportunity, at least for some asset classes which are not actively traded today, and hopefully also for these asset classes like equities, which are currently widely traded, um, uh, at least to provide some competition to centralized companies. Uh, I, I fully agree with Adrien. Uh, like for public equities currently, like the incremental 
efficiency gains that you can achieve are very limited. Uh, as he said, it's uh, it's working very well. Uh, but uh, I think it we will be able to do some improvements probably only when uh, CBDC will be used uh, widely. And it's where uh, on the back office side, uh, it will change everything for those actors. But currently, uh, that's why all the companies working on tokenization are, are mainly working with SMEs or real estate or private equities because it's where it's making sense currently. OK, thank you very much. Um, so then about that, um, are there some trends in the tokenization uh, that you are seeing either from the technical or regulatory perspective that will play out in 2020? Well, that's one of the questions. Well, that will play out in, in 2020. I will, uh, I will leave this to Dominic, who is expert, uh, I think, of, of this field. But one thing that is now starting to move more concretely is, uh, as Dominic mentioned, is, is CBDC, Central Bank Issued Digital Currencies. You know, I think the, the COVID-19 situation with this virus where everybody becomes paranoid of his neighbor and doesn't want to touch cash, um, uh, is a very big, um, very big incentivizer uh, to central banks to create uh, for create a digital version of their cash. Um, and uh, we see now already a dozen central banks globally that are moving. Obviously, they're moving slowly because this is uh, this is a market where generally you think in terms of decades and not in terms of uh, of years. Uh, China is obviously very aggressive with this uh, sort of technologies, but we see you know much closer central banks. Uh, to Switzerland, even SNB itself, um, that is considering uh, a, a CBDC, in particular for um, security settlements. Uh, so I think stable coins with Libra or CBDC, where the stable coin is issued by a central bank, is the big topic that will start becoming, getting more traction um, this year. Now, I would not expect that beyond initiatives like Libra, uh, we see a central bank um, uh, issuing uh, such uh, digital cash in 2020, maybe except China. Yes, for 2020, it will be quite short, I guess. Uh, but the, like the other important thing for tokenization, you need custody, you need a secondary market, and you need uh, e-currency. So when it will come to the market, I don't know yet. Uh, we are lucky to have Libra in Geneva and lucky to have Libra pushing all the central banks to uh, to move on that side and probably to to get that project going on at a faster pace. Uh, but then uh, custody will be the key because you need institutional investors to, to feel confident to invest in those tokens. And uh, that will be the first steps. And for tokens to have any value, you need a secondary market, otherwise it's only buy and hold. And the digitalization process uh, won't always be uh, uh, sufficient enough to attract them. Uh, so in, in the order, it will be custody, uh, central banks, the uh, digital currency, and, and secondary market. Very interesting. And do, do you see some industry moving faster toward the tokenization than other? There's lots of discussion with uh, f uh, asset managers. So all the fund manager, asset manager are looking uh, into it uh, uh, very seriously. Lots of them have done some uh, proof of concept uh, with uh, like tokenizing their units of funds. Um, and all the real estate uh, industry also uh, is, is quite in advance versus the other industry in terms of tokenization. It's probably because it's where it's, it's adding um, much like quite a lot of benefits currently versus the actual situation. OK, thank you very much for that answer. Um, one, one question in the in the list as well is, so Cyril that uh, is asking, what is a digital token? Are the finance already digitalized since 40 years? <laughs> Why well, am I not surprised by the by the tricky question from uh, from Cyril? Um, so <laughs> of course, the finances are already widely digitized. and. Uh, but you know, first of all, you'd be surprised to see how much paper is, is being stored in, in caves uh, uh, under high security. You know, I was at uh, uh, DTCC a year ago in the US, uh, which is uh, one of the largest security you know, uh, repositories or custodians, and uh, they had this huge, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, huge storage rooms with that. Of course, we couldn't visit, but they they showed us how it looked like. 
uh, storing piles of ca uh, piles of paper notes uh, that that, uh, that correspond to securities, and they are the central repository. Uh, and uh, at some point, they had they were subject to floodings, you know, because of the big uh, uh, catastrophe. Uh, when was that? Maybe a few years ago, uh, in in um, uh, in one of the south states of the U.S. Uh, and uh, they had a complete room, completely flooded, and they had to recover all these destroyed documents and try to reconcile this with uh, uh, the digital entries of these documents. So just to show you that, yes, it's digitalized. Yes, um, uh, most of the trading, most of the uh, document exchange is now on digital, digital infrastructure, but it's still backed by paper in the end. Now, beyond this, the difference between what we call a token today and this uh, previous form of digitization is that the token is sort of self-sufficient entity on an open protocol. Uh, the token, if you think about uh, an Ethereum token, is something anybody can touch, anybody can transfer, anybody can, can store, uh, and you don't need to rely on this third party that is sort of closed loop, closed circuit uh, entity that, that you need to rely on and which is essentially an IOU. Uh, you, you don't have the security, it's just a promise from a third party that they owe you the security. If they go bankrupt, potentially, you know, if the if the regulations are not properly properly uh, implemented, you know, you could lose your security in this chain. So I think the main difference is having tokens is obviously just a different way of digitizing a security, but it puts you in control. You are potentially in direct contact with the issuer of the token or the uh, the company backing the underlying, whether it's commodity or, or the, the security itself. And you can remove this entire chain that is very long and that ends up with a piece of paper in a cave um, uh, by having this simple self-sufficient entity on a chain and that is auditable, visible and and, uh, and peer to peer in a way. So I think that's really the power of tokenization and the difference with what we've been digitizing in the last 40 years. Yeah, and, and probably like, uh, like the benefits of blockchain, data integrity, immutability and security it's something that uh, answering lots of questions and, and permitting uh, an audit that it's much more simpler to do. And usually it's uh, like depending to who you're talking to, like the onboarding of clients, uh, the follow-up, the transfer of uh, positions and the follow-up uh, of a registry. It looks pretty simple, but usually it's a nightmare for them to, to manage. And it, it will simplify their life. Thank you very much. Um, I guess maybe more on the regulation side. Uh, so, he's asking what are the main challenges of opening a bank account for a blockchain related company in Switzerland? So, maybe is um, like for a company that, that wants to develop a token and uh, issue assets on the blockchain, does that imply a uh, complication to interact with the currently uh, regulated ecosystem, like for example, banks, etc. When the company, these company needs to open accounts, for example. So maybe uh, I can yeah. start. Uh, for, uh, it's it has been very difficult and it's getting easier. Uh, we had some uh, banks where we had an account previously. For example, we have done a, a capital increase, uh, getting some tokens from another company. And uh, the bank said, if one day you sell them and you credit your account here, we close the account. So it shows that they are not yet uh, always fully ready to to accommodate everything. But when you follow all the rules, and now they are getting much more comfortable uh, with this because for them, blockchain until a few months ago, it was uh, Bitcoin, it was uh, Darknet, and it was uh, anti-money laundering. Well, it was money laundering, and uh, they said, if you have the word, the word blockchain within your uh, status, it was very difficult to open a bank account. But I, I think now most of them are, are much more open, at least in Switzerland and in Geneva. It has, it has certainly improved. Now, I'll tell you a short story which happened to me last week. Uh, we are um, currently going through a capital increase okay, at Medaco, and therefore we need to open an account um, for we could call that on the consignation, so the, the, the account on which you get the liquidity before you finalize the capital increase. And uh, given the, 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 the amount of the transaction, you know, I, I had to go to a different bank to, <laughs> um, it's, it's a long story, but uh, go to a different bank to make sure we will not be subject to 
very high negative interest rates. Okay, because uh, it, it seems like nothing when you speak about 0.75 uh, negative, but when you speak about big amounts, you know, that immediately be, is, it becomes significant. And uh, so I went to different of other banks and uh, I got the same message to, uh, f f from all of them, which is that, oh, Medaco is related to blockchain, therefore you are red flag and therefore it's gonna take weeks, if not months to open an account. And uh, if you think about this, Medaco is, we're nothing more than a software company. We, do, we just do software. We don't buy or sell cryptos. We don't, broke, we, we don't have a brokerage service. We don't, we're not a financial intermediary. We're actually not regulated in any way. Uh, so I could tell you that uh, I have Medaco builds a, a chat application, you know, like a, a Slack sort of application. It would be the same sort of risks uh, from a regulatory point of view. But because we have the word Bitcoin or the word blockchain on our website, uh, well, they consider that we are part of these risky companies. Uh, and it, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. I think uh, a few years ago, that would have been impossible for us to open a different bank account. We were lucky enough to have one bank uh, accepting us as a client, <laughs> which, is a, which is strange that we have to see that as a, as a, as a chance for us to, to become a client to, to a bank. But um, I would say it's still now it's possible for us to open a new bank account, but um, we have all of these frictions and it becomes, it is still painful uh, because you know, they have very strict compliance policies internally and uh, just a set of keywords uh, will put you in this category of dangerous companies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, indeed, to be honest, even as a non-profit association, I had quite a lot of struggle to open a bank account, so <laughs> I understand that it might be complicated for you as well. Um, uh, actually, I mean, it's understandable that in a very new field with new technologies, some uh, more conservative actors are quite reluctant or hesitant for to 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 accept to go in that direction. Um, and and on that subject, would it be uh, an issue? Um, I mean, once you, you you take the steps to 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 develop a token to issue an asset on the blockchain, I mean, would it be an issue? Um, maybe the the. I mean, do you still have the possibility of uh, uh, backtracking on that choice and? Um, I mean, going to another direction then, because it, it, uh, blockchain is uh, usually associated with, with the word uh, uh, immutable or something that you don't have that much control over it. Uh, that, that was actually linked to the previous question with, uh, about the owner rights. Um, I mean, do you see that, do you think it, it, the ecosystem is mature enough? Do you think it's, it's uh, reasonable to start to issue these assets on this blockchain platform? Maybe another question would be, how do you choose uh, which platform uh, blockchain platform do you issue your your assets on? Um, yeah, I don't know if either of you want to answer that question. Sorry? I said, Dominic, do you want to take this one? Okay. Um, so on that side, um, what, uh, first of all, there's something that we didn't mention until now, like before tokenizing something, what we are doing, we are digitalizing a process between an investment opportunity and investors. So you must have a very attractive investment opportunity to start with. This is the basic. Uh, the fact that we are using, in addition, a token makes the process currently more difficult in order to find investors. I believe that in the future it will be easier. So uh, you must have a process where you can make the investor very comfortable. So that's why we started with this uh, ERC triple seven token because it was a token where, in case of uh, loss of the private key, it was not an issue. Uh, the, all the transfers of tokens were controlled by um, a board uh, regulated by Luxembourg uh, legislation, and you don't have more or less risk than any other investment you can do in traditional finance, and. As our investors are qualified investors, they're very familiar with the type of uh, investment they can get with banks. They understand that the structure is exactly the same. And the only thing we're trying to do is to digitize everything, like the onboarding through the KYC and the AMA process, the way they invest, the way they store uh, their tokens. And Currently, the cash, it's still, uh, they have to transfer uh, euros. Uh, it's not, they are not investing with Bitcoin or Ether uh, through, through the platform currently. Uh, so 
not much is changing for them and there's no additional risk for them and we are trying to to reassure them around all this thank you very much um do you want to add something Adrian? no i think that's fine oh uh, okay perfect um so then then about uh, uh difference from uh, from a previous uh, system in place. Um, another question is, what are the main differences between uh, STOs and ICO? Uh, both are used to raise funds, but how are they different? Well, the ICO is the Wild West version of the STO. You know, it's, uh, it's essentially, you know, we, we want to raise uh, liquidity uh, to fund the project, <coughs> whichever it is, and uh, we make some marketing, uh, we build a smart contract to do so, we get paid in Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, we get the liquidity, and uh, then our investors better trust that uh, we actually deliver what we promised. You know, we're not legally bound by a lot of, uh, uh, we don't have sort of warranties for the investors. It's a very free market sort of approach, uh, which uh, if you want my opinion, I think it's actually a great, it's a fantastic thing to do. And uh, in the free markets, you would have this sort of behaviors in the markets and uh, regulators having jumped in this field, now we no longer see ICOs, or we see, I would say, ICOs in um, in very specific uh, uh, with very specific approaches. For instance, you could do an ICO for a utility token, but one of the prerequisites is that um, your service already exists, and what you are raising funds is is not to finance the the, the construction of your service, but more to sell uh, tokens which can be then used to consume the service. So it's essentially a utility token, as I mentioned. So this would be still something you can do, but all of this sort of uh, crowdfunding on the blockchain with uh, uh, with no regulation is no longer possible in most of the uh, regulated, um, uh, you know, most of the first world countries where regulation is now become so important. Uh, an, an STO is the idea of relying on the existing legal framework for securities, uh, whether it's whether it's equities, fixed income securities, derivative products, or any form of security. And to say, I am going to comply with the laws and regulations, and I'm going to take a traditional asset class or something that is, uh, at least understood by the traditional fine bankers, uh, and transform it into something that lives on the blockchain. And here you will suddenly be subject to all of these uh, regulations. Some things you will actually not be able to do by yourself. You may have to go through a bank to do so. You may, you may have to. Uh, to, to be licensed in different ways, potentially be a financial intermediary, depending on what you do. Um, so uh, I think the STO is, is not so different from a formal IPO, you know, which is uh, what we used to know before the ICOs, where you go, you go public on an exchange, uh, except that it's much cheaper in theory. <coughs> you know, we see that it's not so cheap today, but it's, it's, it's theory, it's much cheaper. And um, you then rely on this uh, universal protocol that is uh, the blockchain technology, in particular Ethereum. Yeah, and in, in one word, the difference, like why we move from ICO to STO, it's regulation. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this answer. Um, so one other question. Uh, how do you choose the right platform blockchain to take your asset on? Ah. There's some competition between uh, the different protocols. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah. On the Monaco side, I, I would not know. Uh, what I would say is that we, we see today that for a permissionless ledger, and what I, what I call permissionless uh, is a distributed ledger which doesn't have a specific governance where the parties controlling it are predefined. So something which is readily accessible by any user with an internet connection. Uh, something like Ethereum. For permissionless ledgers, today most companies are working with Ethereum. However, we start seeing Tezos um, uh, gaining traction. And one of the arguments of Tezos is that they are working very hard to get uh, institu financial institutions to onboard the technology and they have very special services and, and uh, enterprise uh, solutions to facilitate this. One of their strong arguments which to be honest, I haven't uh, triple checked myself, but um, this is what they tend to push is that one advantage of Tezos is that they have a, a smart contract language, which is at least partly formally verifiable uh, from a computer science point of view. So you can, uh, you can do some, some formal verification uh, of, the, of its behavior. 
And therefore, it minimizes uh, the risks that we've seen concretize uh, quite often on Ethereum, where you have a bug in your smart contract, and potentially this bug has catastrophic consequences on the whole smart contract and the financial incentives and potentially the reserves that it holds. Um, so on, on Metagross side, I would say today, public ledgers or permissionless ledger would be Ethereum and Tezos mainly. Uh, but we also see quite a few companies that are not ready to move to permissionless ledger uh, and are therefore working with permissioned um, uh, derivatives such as the Corda uh, from R3 or Hyperledger Fabric uh, or the other ones on the market, which uh, one could argue are distributed databases with uh, some cryptographic uh, controls. Uh, but uh, you know they have some of the advantages of of DLTs, but with more centralization. Thank you very much. Um, one question, I mean, it's maybe related to actually this platform choice, but uh, why did Colored Coin never took off as a platform for tokenization? <laughs> the, Dominique, I don't want to, to monopolize the conversation, but Colored Coin is, is a topic I know well because. Uh, um, Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Um, so the funny story is that when we started Medaco in 2015, um, we actually had a bit of a different strategy, which was to focus on institutional services related to tokenization. Uh, so really closer to what, um, uh, to what Dominic and Wiccan are doing today. However, uh, we, we bet, you know, we gambled a lot and we assumed that uh, colored coins on the Bitcoin protocol would be the, the standard technology. And we had built a, com a complete framework based on uh, some of our open source contributions and build a complete stack over it, um, uh, specifically assuming that colored coins will win this, this race. Uh, as you all know, colored coin uh, are almost no longer used today. And uh, ERC20 has, uh, in a way, replaced colored coins in the preferred practice of uh, uh, issue token issuers. I think one of the one of the problems with colored coins was that Bitcoin never planned for um, for other assets on the Bitcoin blockchain than Bitcoin itself. Therefore, colored coins were a little bit of an artificial construction on the Bitcoin blockchain, which was not native uh, to the capacities uh, to the capabilities of Bitcoin. You had to take a tiny particle of a Bitcoin and to associate metadata to this tiny particle and to move it from address to address in a very specific way that you would not lose this meta information and you would satisfy the exact and very painful rules of this, of this ad hoc protocol, uh, non-native ad hoc protocol. And what we've seen is that there were already at the time uh, a few uh, different competing colored coin uh, standards or you know, so-called uh, trying to, to establish a standard. And given that they were incompatible with each other, uh, you could potentially use the wrong wallet with a different colored coin definition and destroy your colored coin by mistake. Um, or you would simply not see the colored coin because your, your standard wasn't the one that was used for issuance. And this is where Ethereum has been so strong by pushing this ERC20 token uh, with a very simple interface, very simple ways to interact with it. They've quickly gained a lot of traction and suddenly colored coin became you know, too messy and too uh, underground for to, to get any momentum uh, going. Thank and you very also much. regarding the platform, uh, what I see and uh, what I believe, uh, working with institutional uh, investors, it's usually uh, they don't really care. Like they prefer to work with the uh, like most used uh, protocol currently. So Ethereum is working pretty well. But what they're really uh, looking at, it's all the legal infrastructure. For them, it's much more important than the tech, which is only one brick within the process. So when we come to a client, we, we don't come and try to sell some technology. Like they really don't care about this. The only thing we are selling when we come with our token, it's, it has been audited by PricewaterhouseCoopers. It's the only thing they care about. But the legal framework around the quality of the asset you want to tokenize uh, is uh, 10 times more important than like the, the protocol you're using. OK, thank you very much. Maybe a last question on the platform. Um, Antoine is asking, um, uh, does tokenization should privilege the most decentralized platform like is and uh, Tezos over the most centralized blockchain as Corda? <coughs> Maybe a quite specific question, but in general, um, 
uh, maybe the aspect of uh, decentralization in the choice of the platform. Uh, I think like the type of platforms that will get the most access uh, will be the ones that uh, where you can use like construct the like the best uh, user friendly business case around and. I've got no clue at what will be the exact uh, infrastructure for Libra, for example. But uh, if Libra has an e currency and is available in three weeks, uh, I can bet you that everyone will do tokens on Libra and will try to do their business on Libra. And, and I guess it's what will happen in 2020. Uh, again, I think it, it really depends what use case we're speaking about. Uh, if we're speaking about conservative companies like some of the large exchanges on the market, uh, they don't they don't really see um, a reason why they should distribute their existing well-functioning centralized infrastructure. So when they consider tokenization, they ask themselves, can we potentially accelerate some of the uh, or, or improve some of the things we do, but obviously keep control and uh, having relying on distributed ledger technology on permissionless ledgers like Ethereum for them would be a horrible pain dealing with re regulators and potentially would be shooting themselves in the foot from a business point of view. You know, if you think about large exchanges, uh, they make revenues on trading. Uh, they have a margin on the trading volume. So uh, why would they start putting tokens on a distributed ledger and potentially having peer-to-peer -peer trading between parties that don't even need to go through them? So I think it really depends where these initiatives are emerging. If you ask uh, the large corporations on the market, some of them are taking a risk to move uh, to permission ledgers, but they are the exceptions. Most of the large custodians or large exchanges are moving to, let's say, Corda sort of infrastructure where they can benefit from some of the distributed ledger uh, aspects, uh, but they still have full control and uh, you know very well-defined governance, um, and they can make sure that this is more of an augmentation of their existing service rather than cannibalization of what they do. Great, thank you very much. Um, another question is, uh, what are the biggest challenges tokenizing securities? How do you tackle them? Biggest challenge is always the legal uh, one. Uh, the technological part is, is usually a commodity, uh, but to find the right legal framework to operate in, and then that, that legal framework is uh, accepted as well by all the institutional investors is currently the key issue and the fact that the legal framework is still evolving, even if uh, uh, we are quite lucky in Switzerland or in Luxembourg where uh, regulation is quite clear and if you're doing more or less what the financial uh, market and world is doing currently and just digitalizing the process, it's, it's more or less okay. Uh, but for me, it's uh, it's everything is linked to legal. Okay, thank you very much. And um, so we have two questions left. So so one I've already uh, uh, been um, answered by Cyril in the chat, but uh, maybe you have uh, something more to add. Um, we have general standards for token like ERC twenty, ERC seven hundred twenty, ERC one thousand one hundred fifty five. Do you see other categories that are currently missing? Like I'm not uh, only Cyril can answer. I, I'm not the, the the developer and the the tech guy in the company, so I've got no clue. Like the triple seven seems to work pretty well for what we want to do and for the type of client we are aiming at currently. Uh, so uh, it's a good start, but I'm pretty sure uh, we will see evolution uh, in the coming uh, months and some of them will be better than the one we are using currently and we'll, uh, we'll just use the new one uh, when it's available and when it makes sense. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for that answer. And um, then maybe a last one. If, uh, so, yeah. So what is a fun but useful application for tokenization? I don't know if you have an example for that. Well, I think it's an easy one. It's crypto kitties. <laughs> it's a True. It's the tokenization of nice pictures. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. And it's interesting to see how um, diverse this uh, tokenization ecosystem has, has been <coughs> in the last few years. It started with uh, 
uh, tokenization as a crowdfunding you know, uh, crowdfunding tool uh, with then tokenization of non-fungible assets, uh, which can be very strange assets to think about it. You know, in the case of CryptoKitties, those are not really assets or they become assets as uh, they become traded. Um, uh, and uh, uh, lately, I would say, I, I don't know whether that would be fun, but I think what we are now facing is the tokenization of asset classes that um, uh, we are not used to potentially have access to. If you think about real estate, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I don't think uh, many people can just say they want to buy a building, for instance. And uh, it means that you are excluded from all of the potential upside that you could get by investing in these sort of assets. Well, tokenization is opening all of these fancy investment opportunities, even if you want to invest a few cents. Okay, so that's the that's the premise of tokenization that it's, uh, it gives access to all of this illiquid and potentially generally expensive to get in uh, new asset classes and makes makes it accessible to the mainstream. So whether that's fun is for you to judge, but I think maybe if it's not fun, it's actually at least a very big game changer in terms of uh, investable a portfolio for uh, the mainstream, myself included. Thank you very much. Indeed, CryptoKitty is a pretty good example uh, considering the that the gaming industry is uh, quite, I've been quite, uh, well, the, the, the first one to digitalize these kind of assets and to, to make them tradable um, among different users, the players. And uh, I think that's, that's one theme where so a lot of progress uh, related to blockchain technology and tokenizable assets as well. Um, actually, so one question that I've been added, um, can tokenization be utilized? Utili uh, can tokenization be, yeah, to help people in poor countries? Hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure that we will see lots of uh, new application uh, with the uh, e-currency coming on, so like with Libra, for example, uh, like the objective is Libra of Libra, it's really to provide a network, an infrastructure network, and then for people to be able to create new applications on that network and to use the Libra uh, uh, probably to reach the unbanked people uh, currently. And I guess uh, like lots of new products will come on the market and I've got no clue about what it will be. It's probably you guys that you will uh, invent them and it will work a little bit like uh, Apple and his uh, app store. Uh, lots of people will create apps and some of them will be cool or they're useful, uh, some fun. So it's, uh, it's it will probably like, I, like I'm very, uh, I really want to see, I hope Libra will come out very soon and I hope it will work because I think it will move all the market of uh, tokenization and blockchain in a, in a very good way. Even if it won't be the, the final thing to use, uh, it will make the, the technology to advance in the good direction. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't see any other question. Uh, so I think we can wrap up. Thank you very much, Adrien Dominique. Uh, for being with us and answering all this question. That, that, that was a very interesting conversation. And um, thank you. Um, we hope to see you soon, maybe in another webinar. And uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for everyone to attend uh, that have attended this live. And uh, so uh, the, the the video will be posted afterward on YouTube. Uh, so you'll be able to, to, to go back to it. Uh, I invite you to go on our social network, on our website, to check our last event, our next event. And um, yeah. Thank you, Thank, thank you very much. For the, uh, the webinar. And, uh, thank you guys for the very interesting questions. Thanks a lot. Have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.